you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Work. I think updated guidelines are very important for uh, for most of the diseases now, especially common diseases like hypertension, asthma, heart failure, acute coronary syndrome. You have to go with the updated lines as the uh, SMLE question is going to be based on new guidelines. So you have to update yourself on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Abdurrahman. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Okay, so uh, again, um, let's now start with uh, the asthma treatment guidelines. I gave you an introduction. Uh, everybody knows what's asthma. The pathophysiology is very clear. There is bronchoconstriction and there is inflammation and inflammatory uh, cytokines, leukotrienes, all taking place in, in, in this disease. So now, without further ado, let's begin with the guidelines and the principles of asthma uh, assessment and the question is how do we assess asthma control mm -hmm. and the answer to that is uh, very simple according to gina what is gina the global initiative for asthma it is a short questionnaire utilized to assist asthma control over the past four weeks which consists of four items daytime symptoms more than twice a week any night waking due to asthma reliever needed for symptoms any activity limitation the control status identifies as follow. So, Dr. Abdurrahman, why are you introducing us to Gina? What is the purpose of this? Well, the purpose is very simple for you to understand the, the way that the Saudi Initiative for Asthma treat their asthmatic patients is using this the ACT test. So the ACT, also known as the asthma control test, is a commonly used tool to assess asthma control, which is correlated and based on the Gina asthma assessment panel. So that's why I introduced you to Gina. So now, um, what is uh, ACT? Short, validated, self-administered questionnaire to assist asthma control in the past four weeks. Unlike Gina, Gina consisted of four items. In here, it consists of five. And they are limitation of activity, shortness of breath, uh, frequency of night symptoms, use of rescue medication, and rating of overall control of the disease over the past four weeks, just like uh, Gina, four weeks, four weeks. Now the ACT score is the sum of five questions, which is scored from one being the worst to five being the best leading to a maximum best score of 25. And this is how you score uh, the patient as a physician so that you proceed with the treatment. So your treatment is based upon the score of the patient. I said it is get categorized into, but you can't see the categories in this image. It is actually in this one. As you can see, above 20, 16 to 19, and below 16, con completely controlled, partially controlled, and uncontrolled. So let's get into the categories which are controlled, partially, and uncontrolled. So the SENA panel, Saudi Initiative for Asthma panel, recommends asthma treatment to be based on the following phases, initiation, adjustment, and maintenance of treatment. Okay. So let's begin with uh, the initiation of treatment. It is to simplify and a, a simplified approach and supplement the initiation of asthma therapy by utilizing the objective measurement with the ACT questioning. So I'm not here to read the image for you. I'm here to make it simple for you. There's a lot of words in here and even more words here, trust me. So let's, let, let me just uh, tell you a couple notes that I took. Basically, basically patients with asthma, often, uh, they often underestimate the presence of symptoms and they tend to assume that their asthma is controlled, even when this is not the case. So therefore, the ACT was developed. And if we have a patient with an ACT score of 20 and above, then this is what we should uh, treat him with. Formitrol, which does anybody know what Formitrol is? Really, nobody knows what Formitrol is. Long-acting. Exactly. Long-acting beta agonist. It's a long-acting beta agonist or inhaled corticosteroid therapy as needed. So basically an anti-inflammatory reliever therapy in the form of inhaled corticosteroid or formitrol combination, uh, with co uh, formitrol combination on as needed basis. And then we also have an alternative option, okay, to use um, uh, inhaled corticosteroids in special uh, situation. And we also have one that is not mentioned in here, it is actually the use of SABA, which is short-acting beta agonist, like salbutamol, uh, with low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. So we have two options in the first step. Okay, now why do we give inhaled corticosteroids? Because 
early introduction of inhaled corticosteroids will lead to greater improvement of the forced expiratory volume, which I just told you in the spirometry exam we expected to be deficient. So uh, inhaled corticosteroids will help us with the FEV1 or forced expiratory volume. Now the step two, which is the partially controlled asthma, um, we have many options. So low dose inhaled corticosteroids, okay, this is the first option. And then we have alternative options. The alternatives include starting formitrol uh, with inhaled corticosteroid combination, again, just like in step one. But also in here, we can also give LTRA, which stands for leukotriene receptor antagonist. Does anybody know what leukotriene receptor antagonist can give me an example of it is? Any example of a drug? Very famous one. We learn it in all lectures. Uh, Montilocast. Monti That's the yes. one. No, the, mm -hmm. the person who said something zoom up, always zoom up, like the end of it, zoom up or um up or map. It's probably a monoclonal antibody. But yeah. And xylotone, I talk about the inhibitor. I'm not sure about the second one you mentioned, Dr. Montilocast. Montilocast. Yes, there we go. Montilocast is a receptor antagonist. Yep, that's the one. So Montilocast is a, is a great one that is given uh, in uh, clinics all the time. And now we get to the final one, which is uncontrolled uh, status of asthma, where we have now, it's a variety of options. So we can give, and here you see low medium dose of inhaled corticosteroid with long acting beta agonist. Okay. Um, so so basically, uh, for patients who have poorly uncontrolled asthma at presentation, initiation of asthma, because in here it says, for patients presenting with severe asthma symptom, consider starting step four. And step four is in the adjustment phase. So let me, let me say in another simplified way, for patients who have poorly uncontrolled asthma at presentation, you should initiate uh, asthma treatment with a combination of medium dose inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonist. Do you see the difference now? We started with low dose inhaled corticosteroids and now we went with medium dose. So we're increasing the dosage. Patients with an acute attack may require short course oral corticosteroid. Short course oral corticosteroids are not recommended. There are better options and I will explain that more in the adjustment phase. This is the longest phase, the longest slide. So please bear with me. I'll try to make it as simple as possible and as quick as possible, okay? So we helped here the patient. The patient's not dead. Um, and uh, now we have to adjust his dosage. And it says here that after initiation, you should follow up one to three months intervals. The CENA panel recommends the utilization of a stepwise approach. And look at, let's look at the stepwise approach. Now, as you can tell in the stepwise approach, there is mild asthma, which is treated with step one and two, moderate, step three, and severe asthma, we have to treat it with step four and even five. Uh, now, any other blank over here, down there, don't, don't focus on it. Focus on the, the green one, the yellow one, and the red one. So step one, again, as we said in the previous slide, formitrol and health corticosteroid therapy, we, we already discussed this. So I'm not going to uh, repeat it, the step one. And now let's go to step two. Now, step two, there's a recommended option, which is a daily low maintenance dose of inhaled corticosteroid with a short acting uh, beta agonist like salbutamol or albuterin, okay, um, as needed basis. And there are alternatives. So I gave you the recommended option, but are there alternatives? Yes. Again, do you remember what we mentioned there? The leukotriene receptor antagonist. So, yes, again, we can give leukotriene receptor antagonist like Monty Lucast, okay? Um, so the thing is, okay, for, for those patients who are reluctant to use inhaled corticosteroids or continue to have side effects from inhaled corticosteroids, that's when we give Monty Lucast. That's the indication. However, there are also disadvantages as Monty Lucast is less effective than low dose inhaled corticosteroids in achieving asthma control and in reducing the risk of attacks. So uh, you as a doctor will watch which one outweighs the other and uh, give the treatment upon it. Now let's go to step three very quickly. The recommended is low dose inhaled with long acting 
And then there are other alternatives. One alternative that I really want to mention in here is the theophyllin. This is not re very much recommended as there is other better alternatives. What are they? Well, for, uh, for example, uh, okay, asthma patients, okay, uh, taking inhaled long-acting beta agonists without inhaled corticosteroids tend to be at risk of asthma attack and hospitalization and death. That's why whenever we give inhaled corticosteroid, it shouldn't be alone, and it should be with something like Montelukast, leukotriene receptor antagonist. But theophylline, there's actually uh, another drug that is better than theophylline, and it's called thiotropium. And you may have heard of this name from epratropium, tritropium. There's also teotropium. Teotropium is a long-acting anticholinergic agent, um, which is approved for the treatment of COPD. Why am I, well, marketing this drug instead of theophyllin in this step? Well, simply because evidence and research shows that when teotropium is added with an inhaled corticosteroids, this will improve symptoms and reduce risk of attack and improve the lung function in patients with an inadequately controlled asthma. So that's why teotropium in combination with inhaled corticosteroid is a far better option or alternative in step three, as well as step four, than um, theophyllin. You know, theophyllin, it's also found in tea, which is very famous as we all know it. Now moving on into step four, um, consultation with an asthma specialist is indeed recommended in this case, if not even forced, because you should consult an asthma specialist in step three, but if you don't consult an asthma specialist in step four or five, then don't blame the patient if he sues you, basically. What are the recommended options? Medium to high dosage of inhaled corticosteroids. Again, we started with low dose, and now we're going up to medium to high dose. And there are other alternatives, obviously. And one of them, most importantly, again, teotropium with inhaled corticosteroids, leading us to step five, where there is now an early consideration of biological therapy. Why? Because we reached the high dose of inhaled corticosteroids. We reached the whole combinations with long-acting beta agonist, with leukotriene receptor antagonist, with teotropium. We reached all combinations and highest dosages. So at this step, we're going to be using biological therapy, which indeed saves the patient from frequent chronic use of oral corticosteroids. See, it's a less preferred controller, oral corticosteroids. It's not effective. It has high side effects uh, compared with the monoclonal antibodies or the biological therapies. And we have in here many names, anti-IgE, anti-interleukin-5, anti-interleukin-4, and I have indeed drugs for all of these. So the anti-IgE therapy is the most recommended, which is like omalizumab, okay, for those patients uncontrolled or on maximum treatment at step four. So step four didn't work, you go with omalizumab on step five. There's also uh, mipolizumab, which is an interleukin-5 therapy, and there's also ben benralizumab, which is also an interleukin-5 therapy. The difference between these two drugs is that mipolizumab is used in eosinophilic uh, asthma or asthma where there is high eosinophils above 150. And benralizumab is used when eosinophils are higher than 300. Now, the last choice is daplimumab, which is, uh, sorry, daplimumab, which is an anti-interleukin-4 therapy uh, receptor antibody, which is indicated in severe eosinophilic asthma. So I know it is complex, but this is the stepwise approach that the Saudi Initiative uh, for Asthma uh, developed. And it can be as simple as mild asthma, but as hard and severe and you need even with, the, we know what therapies we're gonna give, we still need to consult an asthma specialist in this case. So that's it. Uh, th this was the toughest part of the lecture. Hopefully uh, it was clear. And now we're moving on to the maintenance. So regular follow-up with a healthcare uh, worker is essential. Again, a follow-up is at one to three months interval. 
Once asthma is controlled and the control is maintained for at least three months, a step down in pharmacological therapy is recommended. Watch how they said it's a step down and not abrupt discontinuation. Now, why? Because in here, the following are the general recommendations. All of these recommendations, I'm not going to read for you. There is a common denominator in all of these general recommendations. And the common denominator is that they're all should be reduced uh, gradually and not abruptly. So reduction in the therapy is recommended gradually. It is recommended to be clearly explained to the patient that asthma control may deteriorate if he abruptly discontinues, taper slowly. So all the same um, advice, which is gradually and slowly taper the drugs. And now we get to the final part, which is the management of acute asthma. In simple two slides, very quickly, very simple. Um, this is the management of acute asthma according to Sina again. And I'm not going to explain all of this. The key factors in here are moderate asthma attacks. So the peak expiratory flow is 50 to 75%. This is moderate asthma attack. Acute severe asthma, look at the peak expiratory flow. It's now decreased. If you're asking what's the normal peak expiratory flow, it's above 75 for any patient. Now, when he reaches 30 to 50%, this is acute severe asthma. Now, life threatening asthma. Not only is there an issue with the peak expiratory flow, but his oxygen saturation also deteriorated, just like in our patient that had his oxygen 89% when he presented to the ER. Near fatal, now what are we expecting? We're expecting the uh, carbon dioxide changes and the respiratory acidosis. And this is why this is important, because death can occur within seconds in, in such patient if you don't take care of it. Again, I'm not going to explain this or go through it. Very simply put, I already explained the past, the moderate, the severe, and the life-threatening. And they all have a common denominator in the treatment, which is keep the oxygen above 92%. It's just that in here, you start simply with bronchodilator like salbutamol and corticosteroid like prednisone. And then as it gets more severe, you go with bronchodilator, ipratropium, and then we go with corticosteroid and another corticosteroid like hydrocortisone. And then when it gets life-threatening, you must not only do the previous, but also do an ABG to check for respiratory acidosis. This is my uh, reference, which is Sina. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.